for the people to log in. All so right. hello, good afternoon. We'll wait uh, two more minutes before we kick off today's webinar to give chance for more chance for everyone to be connected. Thank you. Just we are giving more chance for more people to connect. Good afternoon, everyone. So I think we have, I will have a short introduction. So let's start. Uh, hello again, my name is Beher El Badri from Metronic Medical Affairs team, and I will facilitate today's webinar. I hope all you are staying safe and thank you for being with us in the second series of Abdominal Wall Repair webinar. We will announce the, the full episode of the series at the end of our webinar in full detail. But in summary, we will have the first one today it will be led by Professor Mark on the other use of inguinal hernia guidelines in the real world. The second one will be next Tuesday as well on the guidance of hernia surgeon on challenge of COVID-19. This is a guidance report from European Hernia Society and the valuable insight from the most influential publication in the surgery. And also will followed by the third one on July uh, 8 in laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. This also will uh, be led by Professor Henry Hoffman from Switzerland. And the last one also will be in grown hernia repair and tip technique, and would be also by uh, Professor or Dr. Marius Papadis from Greece. So the agenda, uh, again, all the detail will be announced at the end of our webinar. And we will post the link for the next webinar in the chat box. It would be in the right side. I will post it soon. And we hope all this will bring a value for you. As you can see on my screen, uh, I will can now move for some instruction about uh, this today's meeting to be all uh, aware about. So uh, I will move now to it. Sorry for this. Yes, so uh, I, I, will, I will move this. So this meeting will be on, uh, on, a, on a silent mode. You all participants will be in a silent mode or video and audio. Uh, however, you can write all your question in the chat box. Uh, so please, uh, on Q and A box, actually, sorry. And chat box, leave the chat box only for, uh, if you have any uh, issues with the connections or any issues with the presentation, you can write for us. Uh, so this meeting will be recorded for training purpose. And please don't take any screenshot or photo during the presentations. And avoid to have someone uh, close to you to because this data might be uh, not uh, suitable for everyone around you. And please don't share any patient data and your question during the presentation. So this is just for, for your information. This is meeting would be recorded. So definitely we are all aware about the COVID-19 situation and the impact it has and to have in the ability to attend in-person training. Saying is that we are in Metronic uh, committed to continuous to uh, support our healthcare professional with many clinical training and education. So in, during this time, we use a different platform and tool, such a webinar, which could be useful at this time. And before we start uh, today's webinar, uh, let me to welcome and introduce our expert today, Professor Mark Nesseritz. Hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, good professor, afternoon, uh, good afternoon, sir. So uh, Professor Mark is a professor of surgery and head of clinic, of clinic in the Department of Abdominal Surgery in the University Hospital of uh, Catholic University, Leuven, Belgium. And he's a previous president of European Hernia Society, and he's a past editor in a chief of Hernia, the World Journal of Hernia and Abdominal World Surgery, as his honorary member of the Asia, Asia Pacific Hernia Society and the founding president, and the current member of the Belgian section for abdominal wall surgery, section of Royal Belgian Society of, uh, of Surgery, and he has a publication more than 100 articles in peer reviewed journals. So, welcome again, Dr. Uh, Professor Mark. And thank you for being with us. 
Uh, and again, I need to highlight, as you can see in the screen, that the agenda, as Professor Mike will have a presentation for 60 minutes uh, on the use of inguinal and hernia guidelines in the real world. And it will be followed by some question from your side. So please, whenever you have the question in your mind, please write it down in the Q&A box. And of course, our professor, our, at the end of his presentation, he will make his best, all the best to address all these questions one by one in the last 30 minutes. And in addition to that, our expert may, to make this webinar is more interactive. He is prepared, Dr. Marek prepared, Professor Marek prepared a few checkpoints. So please stay tuned. He will publish this, uh, let's say, uh, checkpoints during his presentation. And this is from my side. So uh, Professor Marek, the floor is yours. Please kick off today's webinar. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Maher, for the introduction. Thank you, sir. I will try to go to the full screen. Is that okay to you, to everybody? Yes, I believe so. It's now it's full screen. All right. So thanks a lot. And uh, give me the opportunity in the next 60 minutes to give you some uh, hints and highlights on inguinal hernia guidelines. First, the first part on the guidelines per se, as they were published uh, more than two years ago. And in the last 30 minutes, just to, to chat a little bit on what to do with this in your busy surgical practice as a, a general surgeon taking care of hernias, but also of many other things. So what does this mean, this, uh, these guidelines in your, in your daily surgical life? These are my disclosures. Um, I will not discuss uh, individual mesh products, so I believe uh, they are not relevant for the lecture uh, this afternoon. And Baher asked me just to uh, highlight again the special period we are in. And as you all uh, know, this is uh, an image on the left side of the air traffic just one year ago, March 19, and on the right side, March 20. And uh, of course, this is all related to this uh, coronavirus and the impact it had not only in Europe, but in the whole uh, world on, uh, on our activities, both professionally and, uh, and private. And Baher just asked me to, give, to show you two slides uh, or a few slides on, on, first of all, the status of corona in Belgium. This is Belgium. We are an 11 million inhabited country in the middle of Western Europe. Uh, as you know, our capital is Brussels, which is in here. And uh, we have uh, many European Union institutions uh, located here in Brussels. And you can see here, this is a fairly recent overview on the incidence of corona cases um, confirmed here in Belgium. And dark green is much higher than, for instance, almost white, like here in the south of Belgium. This is the number of cases that we had in Belgium starting early March till, uh, till now, the beginning of the week. And you see we had a peak of uh, almost 1,500 new cases per day uh, beginning of, uh, of April. But more importantly, of course, than the number of cases is unfortunately the number of deaths. And you see that the curve closely follows the curve of the incidents uh, all over. Um, again, with more than 300 people uh, dying, unfortunately, um, uh, at the top of the pandemia, which was uh, early April, as I just told you. And as you can see here in the inset, most people uh, were older than 75 or 85 years old. Uh, who died, but even uh, patients uh, much, long, much younger, 25, 44, or 45, 64, unfortunately succumbed due to this uh, virus. Uh, two slides to, before we uh, kick off on, on resources that might be helpful for you as a surgeon. And as Baher already said, there will be a webinar uh, uh, organized by uh, Medtronic next week on, on COVID-19. This will deal probably mainly with hernia, but if you're interested as a surgeon to, to know more about COVID-19 and your surgical practice, I really advise you to go to this website of the American College of Surgeons, where there is a, a whole uh, website with all different uh, items, education, ethical considerations, um, and so on, on, on the effect of, uh, of COVID-19 in your daily surgical practice. Uh, after the lockdown, as is the case in many countries, uh, especially in Europe and, uh, and North America. And for those who are more into uh, endoscopic surgery, um, 
I'm happy to tell you that currently, even today, uh, the virtual Congress of the EAS is running. We were planned to, to head to Krakow uh, at this really very moment, but unfortunately, due to the pandemia, the Congress, the live Congress was cancelled and was replaced by a virtual Congress. And uh, again, it's running for the moment. So if you're here, you're not looking at the virtual Congress, but if you're really interested in surgical issues, endoscopic surgical issues and Corona, I advise you to go uh, to the virtual Congress tomorrow. You see at five o'clock, there is a whole session until uh, 6.40 starting on uh, Corona and emergency surgery, oncology, laparoscopy, how to recover from the lockdown. So especially with the eyes of the European Association for Endoscopic Surgery. But let's, uh, let's come back to the main uh, task of today. And indeed, as Baher said, to, to make it interactive, I would like to kick off with a, with a short uh, question uh, for a moment. And th that's the next, that's the following one. Uh, have, you read, have you read any guidelines on a surgical topic uh, before? And you can answer by yes, briefly, yes, extensively, or uh, no. And I just saw before we started that we have uh, almost 200 people, I think, uh, logged in for the moment. So I'm curious to see how people vote for the moment. Okay, that's not too bad. Um, one fourth of you has uh, read guidelines extensively, but most of you know about it. So altogether we have uh, 80, 86 percent uh, knowing guidelines and having looked at them. So that's not too bad. Uh, and we have 14 percent of people who have uh, not looked at any guidelines. So I think this is a good start of, uh, of, this, uh, of this topic. Talking about guidelines, ladies and gentlemen, then the first question, of course, is do we need to improve surgery and, and especially in detail hernia surgery? And as you all know, we still have two main outcome parameters in inguinal hernia surgery. This is on one hand recurrence, but of course, uh, much more important uh, in terms of quality of life is chronic inguinal pain uh, postoperatively in the groin, which can be really very, very, very disastrous for the patient, of course, uh, firstly, but also for the uh, healthcare professional uh, who has to treat uh, this group of patients. Just another example uh, from uh, one of the big uh, uh, European databases. This is the Danish Hernia database published in the American Journal of Surgery in 2015. What did uh, the authors do? Well, they looked at all very small umbilical and epigastric hernias, smaller than two centimeter or two centimeter large between January 8 and December 10. So this is really the, the piece of cake that you would even let your resident uh, operate under your assistance. And these authors looked at clinical recurrence and reoperation rate up to five years post-op. And astonishingly, uh, you can see that almost one in five, almost 20% came back uh, up to five years post-op for a recurrence or for a reoperation. Uh, so even this, this small, very, very, uh, uh, simple, uh, may I say, umbilical hernia can give some problems. On the other side of the spectrum, there is the giant parastomal hernia, often combined with uh, midline incisional hernia. And because of the quality of the data, I go back to the, the Danish hernia database uh, with all some well-recognized uh, and uh, very scientific uh, uh, authors. And what they did in this paper in original contribution of, uh, of some years ago, and they looked at the outcome of uh, parastomal hernia repair in, in their database. And as you can see here, highlighted in yellow, 6% of patients died within the first 30 days after uh, uh, inguinal hernia repair, uh, sorry, after parastomal hernia repair. And emergency repair was the strongest risk factor for a reoperation or death. So these are dramatic, these are dramatic numbers, and we have no reason whatsoever to believe that uh, in other countries uh, we are doing so much better than in Denmark, I would even say uh, on the contrary. So there is some uh, work to be done, and not only we are looking at that, but also governing bodies and authorities are looking into this, because in many, many countries we are moving from the old volume-based uh, surgery 
to value-based surgery. So, so in the end, we will need to show that we are delivering good care for this type of patient, benchmarking with our peers uh, before we will get uh, any payment in the future, probably. So let's go back to the market in the middle of uh, India, where we will look for the ingredients for better hernia surgery. And of course, the foremost all over is excellent surgical technique. You need to know what you're doing. You need uh, the technical capacities. You need uh, your cognitive uh, background uh, before entering into theater. This is, uh, of course, of crucial importance. But you also want an updated clinical decision support. This can be guidelines, but ideally, this should be even an online uh, application that you can use in your daily practice for your decision uh, to be taken. Um, and why is that? Because you want to deliver optimal patient care. You have a very busy clinical practice. There is so much clinical and scientific data that you cannot keep any overview anymore. Moreover, there is more than just having a look at data. You need a critical appraisal of them and an integration of all them together if they're dealing with the same fact. And guidelines, if they are very practical to you, they need to finish up with recommendations and the real clinical decision support, as I just told you. And of course, guidelines are only interesting and useful if they are regularly updated. So I think these are important points. I will not go into the medical legal points of guidelines. If you want, you can ask me later on. Um, I have a strong opinion about that, and I'm very happy to share, to share that with you uh, later on. Guidelines, uh, as you can see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are made or were made by many different societies. You see here the American one, the International Endohernia Society, the EAES, America's Hernia Society, Asia Pacific, Australasian, and also the Afro Middle East Hernia Society. Some of them have published guidelines, some of them not collaborating, others collaborating. And so this group that you can see of 50 uh, experts from all over the world uh, took the initiative uh, many years ago, almost five years ago, to, to make international guidelines. And uh, as you all know, this uh, um, ended up in, in the guidelines, hernia search guidelines published uh, in 2018 in hernia. So I'm aware of that. Probably you are also aware of that because most of many of you have read guidelines and probably also hernia guidelines. But it's very easy to find them. If you just type hernia guidelines in Google, and this is what I did a few days ago, the, the two last ones really refer on the first page to the hernia search guidelines. As you can see, international guidelines from growing hernia management. This is an open access paper, so you don't have to pay. You don't have to be a member of any society. You can go to this uh, very bulky paper, as you can see, 165 pages. Um, and you can read uh, all of it. I will just give you some hints. I will not go very much in detail unless you ask me during the Q&A. You, you can see that the paper was published two, two and a half years ago and is already cited almost 280 times uh, in this uh, short period. But uh, even if you don't go to Google, but you go to any of the websites of the participating societies, very often on the homepage already, you will find a link to the same, uh, to the very same guidelines. And for those of you who don't master English so well, thanks to the help of uh, Metronic, a summary of the international guidelines was uh, published in many different languages, as you can see here, German, Spanish, French, Italian, Dutch, and Polish. And uh, through the website of the European Hernia Society, as you can see here, you can, uh, easily find them and uh, download them for free. Of course, it's not the full uh, document of 165 pages, but it's a very, very good uh, summary of uh, the guidelines for you to be used. And last but not least, also on Facebook and Twitter, it has a specific hashtag uh, on, uh, on Twitter. There is a, the International Hernia Collaboration on Facebook, where the guidelines are very often uh, referred to and, uh, and mentioned. So I would say, ladies and gentlemen, if you are still really not aware of these guidelines two and a half years after publishing, I guess you must, must be living on another planet. So just to give you some hints, the guidelines um, are organized in organizational, preoperative, 
perioperative and intraoperative aspects. And we have some conclusions, we have some recommendations, and of course, the strongest one for you to, to be taken into account in your daily practice are the, seven, are the, are the 47 strong uh, recommendations. And again, I will highlight to some of them uh, during the next few minutes. Which methodology did we use? We used the GRADE uh, methodolo methodology. You can uh, go to this uh, reference paper or to the GRADE website to know more about it. But as you can see, the evidence is uh, graded as very low, low, moderate, or high based on the quality of the uh, pub published uh, literature on that. And then uh, based on this uh, quality, uh, the group, the guidelines group, could end up with no recommendation, a weak recommendation, or a strong recommendation. And even weak recommendations could be um, highlighted or upgraded, I must say, to strong recommendations if the guidelines group felt that uh, they were very important uh, for you to be uh, uh, taken up in your daily surgical practice. This is an interesting paper that I just want to allude to very shortly, which was published very recently in surgical endoscopy in the beginning of this year um, with, the same, with the same hernia surge group and with the group of the Netherlands uh, guided by Maarten Simons, Ja Bonnier and uh, Nadine van Denendaal. And what, what did we do? Um, well, the guidelines were presented at four different congresses. The EHS Congress in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, the EAES uh, Congress in Amsterdam during that same year, the APHS meeting in Tokyo in 2016, and the American Hernia Society meeting in Cancun. And we asked the participants whether they agreed with some of the um, guideline recommendations or conclusions. And when I will present the guidelines in the next few slides, you will see that there will always be a, a banner coming up with those colors. Blue is European Hernia Society. Orange is European Association of Endoscopic Surgery. Green is American Surgeon Society, yellow is Asia Pacific, and overall is altogether in brown. So you will see also on every slide, not only the opinion of the experts guided by the evidence, by the literature, but also the opinion of all those people participating and voting at any of those four congresses. So in this way, the, the guidelines, the recommendations, the conclusions will be put a bit more in surgical perspective. Of course, it's not the surgeon who is important, but it's the patient who is important. And unfortunately, only in English, but still very useful for those of you who use English as their mother language. There was a summary for patients published also in Hernia in 2018, um, where on two pages, the guidelines are um, illustrated for the patients and explained to patients. So this also can be printed and used for, uh, for your informed consent with the patient. But so let's go back for the second question, ladies and gentlemen. If you as a surgeon uh, had a hernia today, tomorrow, a symptomatic unilateral hernia, what would you prefer yourself? A suture repair, A, uh, or number one as choice, a Liechtenstein repair, number two, a laparoscopic repair as number three, or as many people say, I don't care, as long as the surgeon knows what he or she is doing and I will follow the advice of my surgeon. This is option four. So I'm really very curious what you as surgical community would do. You know that four, one in four males have a hernia, have an ingle hernia. I had one, I had it repaired. So uh, my option is in between one of those four. And I'm very curious to see what the majority of the group thinks. Very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. I hope uh, I, I, can, I will take a picture, if I may, because this is uh, very interesting data. So we can see only 2% a suture repair. One third goes for Liechtenstein. A bit more than half go for laparoscopy, but still 10% will say, I leave it completely to my surgeon. So very interesting data. Thank you very much, uh, Hugo. And we go to the next slide. So. A very strong recommendation. Of course, the first one is what should I do? Should I use a suture repair? Should I use a mesh repair? There is much to do about meshes, uh, as, you as you know from the gynecological scene. Well, with a strong uh, upgrading uh, recommendation, 
the guidelines committee said a mesh-based repair is recommended for patients with inguinal hernias. And you see that 95% all over of uh, attendees at the four congresses followed this uh, strong recommendation. Of course, it's very, very logical that you have to look at your local national resources, at your expertise, and at specific patient and hernia characteristics. So again, with a strong recommendation, uh, it is recommended to tailor your treatment. And of course, tailoring is a very big word. Everybody will give it his, his or her own definition. But again, just to say that there is not one way uh, down to hernia repair, you need to try to tailor based on all those different parameters. Let me just say again here that you will see the level of evidence. Very low, low, moderate, and uh, high. Uh, and of course, this is important. So if we say tailor, this is at least the minimum of, of tailoring that, again, the guidelines group thinks that people should do with a strong recommendation. You at least, you need to provide to your patients an anterior approach, putting the mesh more superficial in most circumstances, and the posterior approach, putting the mesh in a preperitoneal space. So that if you have a recurrence, you have at least a virgin plane to be used. But we and the, her the, the, the Hernia Search Guidelines Committee thought that you need to master both approaches. And again, we are followed here by 91% of the participants of the meetings. If you look only at costs, and of course, this is mainly, of course, for, the, for Western Europe and for the United States, where most of these studies have been done, from a cost and effectiveness perspective, a day case laparoscopic or endoscopic repair, we should say, with minimal use of this space disposables is recommended. Uh, high level of evidence and a strong recommendation. As you can see, only followed by two thirds of all participants. And this is mainly, of course, uh, due to local circumstances. For instance, in Germany, day case laparoscopic surgery or day case surgery, hernia surgery is not beneficial financially is not stimulated on a financial way so uh, these are of course very important aspects that play a role and where we believe that authorities should should really embark on to um, facilitate uh, this day case surgery what about uh, laparoscopy or Liechtenstein? well especially in bilateral uh, hernia repairs their laparoscopy is really recommended for a primary inguinal hernia, provided, of course, that's always the same, that the surgeon has the expertise and resources. Strong recommendation, 91% following. So you can debate about a unilateral one, but for a bilateral one, the evidence and the large majority of people uh, agree that laparoscopy is the way to go. As I just said, in a unilateral, you can go for Liechtenstein, you can go for laparoscopy. Um, as I will uh, expand on in a few minutes. But the use of other implants to replace the standard flat mesh in Liechtenstein technique, and then we talk about self-gripping meshes, we talk about mesh devices, we talk about plugs and so on, is currently not recommended uh, because often you will, you will need two different planes, the anterior posterior plane, it's more costly, and uh, there is no overall shown clear benefit to do it. So until there is more evidence available, the standard flat mesh in Liechtenstein technique is, uh, is still uh, favored by the group and also by uh, the field, uh, if I may say. So again, uh, comparable with what I just said, three-dimensional implants, plug and patch, bilayer devices are not recommended because of the excessive use of foreign material, the need to enter both the anterior and posterior plane and the additional cost. Again, followed by 82% of people. If you go for laparoscopy, as we said, uh, more than 50% would go for a laparoscopic repair of the audience. Well, is there an advantage of going by TAPP, transabdominal, or by staying completely extraperitoneal, TEP? No, not anymore. Uh, in the, many years ago, there, there was a trend, uh, but, but it seems now that this is really based on the choice uh, sorry, on the, the choice of the surgeon, on the surgeon's skills, education, and experience, but there are no hard arguments to say that one of the uh, other is, uh, is better or worse. Strong recommendation, followed by almost 100% of uh, people. 
What about women? Well, ladies and gentlemen, indeed, uh, women are uh, is a special group, uh, also for uh, hernias. And um, it's clear that in women, often uh, you can find more frequently than in, in males, a, a femoral hernia. And this is one of the main reasons that with a strong recommendation upgraded um, and followed by three quarters of the participants, uh, this, the committee says that if expertise is available, women with groin hernias are recommended to undergo a laparoscopic repair with mesh implantation. So uh, this is an important one. And as I said to you, this was a weak recommendation, but strongly upgraded by the guideline group. What about femoral hernia per C? So we don't talk about women now, but in general, if you if you have a patient with a, with a femoral hernia and if you know it, uh, on beforehand, of course, uh, by clinical examination or by uh, imaging. Well, again, it's a copy paste of the previous slide. Providing expertise is available, a laparoscopic endoscopic repair is also uh, proposed for elective femoral hernia repair. A little bit the same data, again, strongly upgraded, and three quarters of the people uh, joining the different meetings agreeing with that. I alluded to this one already uh, briefly before. It's an important one. If you want to treat recurrent hernias, and most of us, of course, still do, because even five, six, seven, or up to 10% of the hernias we see are still recurrent hernias. Well, if uh, there is a failed anterior tissue repair, so suture repair or Liechtenstein repair, and the patient come back with a comes back with a recurrence, there is a very, very high consensus with a strong recommendation, 91% following, that you should embark on a posterior mesh by laparoscopic uh, repair, because in this way, you can use another plane, uh, better recovery, less chance for complications and for chronic pain. And this is vice versa. Uh, many people uh, would maybe embark back again on a posterior approach, but um, First of all, let's not make it too difficult. And secondly, let's, let's follow the same principle as before in the previous slide, which means that if you have a failed posterior repair with a mesh in the preperitoneal space after laparoscopy, Kugel, uh, uh, whatever uh, technique, uh, go for an anterior repair with a flat mesh for avoiding the scarred uh, tissue. And uh, in this way, you will probably do the most benefit to your patient. Again, a strongly upgraded recommendation and followed by 90% uh, of the people. This is one of the last ones that I uh, will allude to before embarking on the second part of, of the lecture. And this is mesh. And this is a difficult one. And I took the, I took the uh, initiative to show you not only the recommendation, but also two new uh, studies that were published very recently. Let's first go to the guidelines. The guideline committee says that large pore monofilament synthetic flat meshes with pores of 1 to 1.5 millimeter and we call that large pores relatively large pores and meshes with a burst strength which is strong enough and strong enough for most of us is 60 newton per square meter as tensile strength or burst strength um, in all different directions is the material that should be used why is this a weak recommendation? First of all, because there is some evidence, but most evidence has been done based on weight or density. And you know that weight or density is evaluated by grams per square meter. And it's only very recently that people have gone into uh, the evaluation of pore size. And this is more, for the moment, this is more a theoretical um, recommendation here because again, as you will see in the next slides, most people still use in their daily practice the word lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight um, before, before choosing a mesh. So maybe this will prove to be a strong recommendation a few years when, when we really know that large pores of this size um, are, are more beneficial. Moreover, it needs to be said that large pore has also a maximum because there is this seems to be unlimited 
but you can clearly see that the limit is 1.5 or even 2 millimeter. But in the past, we had measures of 2 and 3 millimeter pore size, and they were much more prone to bulging or bursting or central mesh failure. So this is, of course, not what we want. But just as I told you, talking about meshes and especially talking about mesh characteristics and burst strength, uniaxial tensile strength, anisotropy, elasticity, compliance, and so on, it makes us sometimes very, very confused. And so this is why before finishing by hair on the first part, I would like to show this paper published in surgery earlier this year. It's a, it's a systematic review and a meta-analysis of a, of a very um, experienced and highly scientific group uh, guided by Ine Bergmans uh, from the Netherlands. And what they did is evaluating in Liechtenstein lightweight mesh versus heavyweight mesh. And for them, the definition was the following. Lightweight meshes 50 or less gram per square meter. Heavyweight, 70 gram or more uh, per square meter. And you can endlessly debate about this until the sun goes down tonight, but we, I won't do it, don't worry, about, about the definition. But if you follow this definition, and I think it really makes sense to follow this definition in daily practice, they clearly saw that there was not a huge benefit, but there was a slight benefit for any pain. Here you can see it. The significant reduction was seen for any pain after lightweight mesh compared with heavy made mesh. This is the single and only advantage of using a lightweight or a large pore mesh in Liechtenstein. No difference in the recurrence, no difference in severe chronic pain, only the general postoperative pain and any pain, so not only severe pain, is slightly reduced, it seems, from this recent paper after using lightweight mesh. So this is indeed why also me, in, if I do a Liechtenstein, I use a large pore or a lightweight mesh, because there does not seem to be a disadvantage and only a minor advantage. And very strangely, ladies and gentlemen, in laparoscopy, it's completely different. It's just the contrary, and it's the same group of Ine Bergmans who published it, but it's followed by many other people, and uh, the, the methodology of this paper published in the annals is very, very nicely done. And I will try to guide you through with um, this uh, uh, forest plot. And this is the forest plot for recurrence. You see if there is no, recur no difference between lightweight and heavyweight, the diamond here will cross the one line. If the diamond is diverging into this direction, it's favoring heavyweight mesh. And in the other direction, it's favoring lightweight mesh. And you can clearly see that for all hernias together, um, recurrence seems to be higher when using a lightweight mesh in laparoscopic repair. This is probably mainly true for big direct hernias, but the, the studies are not sufficiently enough detailed to, to do this kind of sensitivity analysis. So again, recurrence seems to be higher with a lightweight mesh after laparoscopy. You will say, but what about pain then? Well, if you look at any chronic pain, there is a tendency in favor of lightweight mesh, as we just said for Liechtenstein, but it's, the difference is not so impressive. And for the moment, most people believe that this and this together both weigh into the advantage or the choice of evaluating a heavyweight mesh instead of a uh, lightweight mesh. Last but not least, the authors did here a sensitivity analysis for severe pain. And even for severe chronic pain, you see that the diamond becomes bigger because the confidence interval is larger. But he also here, there is a trend in favor of lightweight mesh. But since the diamond is crossing the one line, it's not statistically significant. And so we cannot say purely based on these data of well-designed uh, randomized control trials that lightweight mesh is better, even not for severe chronic pain. So summarizing, lightweight mesh probably in Liechtenstein as number one choice, heavyweight mesh or normal pore mesh probably as number one choice in laparoscopic repair. This is the end of part one. Um, and Bahir, I think I should just continue. Is that correct? 
Yes, yes, sir. You can shoot. Okay. So we'll take the question at, at the end of our session. All right. And so uh, I hope uh, most of you are still uh, online and even awake and enthusiastic. So uh, let me just ask you this third question. What, uh, what is your opinion on guidelines? You, some of you have read them extensively, briefly. Some of you haven't read them. What do you think? After having read them, after not having read them, useful definitely, probably, not sure, or you really don't think so? So please cast a vote. I don't know how many people are uh, participating for the moment, but we'll see it in a moment. 240, wonderful. Congratulations, Baher. So let's Thank see how many speak. people of the 240 are really voting. Okay, let's say half of them. Um, two thirds uh, say guidelines could be useful uh, and 25% uh, extra. So there is only a minority, a very small minority, I might say of 6% that, that says guidelines are not useful or I'm not sure. So. Uh, I agree with you that, that uh, guidelines can be useful for the reasons that we alluded to in the beginning of the presentation, uh, because it offers for you a kind of summary of the current evidence. But of course, there is more, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Hugo. Indeed, there is more than just making guidelines. Just making guidelines makes the job not done. Indeed, there is a question mark instead of an explanation mark. And I will try to give you some hints on how to use them in your daily practice. Dissemination, implementation, it's clear in the guidelines also mentioned that all countries or regions should develop local, regional, national dissemination and implementation strategies. There is very low evidence, but I've, I think most of you will agree on that. So this was a strongly upgraded recommendation. And as you can see, 90, almost 90% 90 of the participants at the four meetings um, agreed with that. Uh, dissemination can be done and should be done through the EHS national chapters. Here you see uh, a meeting in Vienna during the European Honey Society meeting organized by uh, Professor Kortelny. And here we had an, a national uh, chapter meeting with all national delegates of different European countries. And of course, they have the, the task to uh, to disseminate the guidelines in their local uh, circumstances, in their region or in their country. And it's important, ladies and gentlemen, um, that, that guidelines, as we said already, should be tailored to, to the local circumstances, local protocols to improve this local applicability. And then I mean concerning the presence of expertise, concerning the presence of resources, but also concerning sociocultural um, aspects should be taken into account when uh, implementing uh, these guidelines all over the globe. Training is of course important because if we train our residents, if we train our students, if we train our junior consultants with the guidelines, uh, this is of course the first, the first step. And there is strong evidence and therefore also a strong recommendation that a goal-directed curriculum which includes anatomical review, procedural steps, intra-op decision-making, and simulation-enhanced technical skills will make you a better hernia surgeon. There is evidence. There is general agreement. You see 97%. It's a, it's a wonderful voting for this uh, statement. But of course, this is theory. And again, it's, it's very important that different societies, different national sections of European, American, Afro Middle East, Asia Pacific, and so on, uh, societies take this into hand. And uh, there is still some work to be done. Training, as I told you, uh, one very nice example of the, the Hernia School of, uh, of Germany, the German Hernia School, governed by Wolfgang Reinpold uh, and uh, his colleagues, um, under the uh, control and guidance of different um, German societies. Well, what they do, as I just said, they implement the current guidelines in their book, in their training, in their standardized um, 
curriculum. So this is, of course, um, uh, very, very um, important for guiding people uh, from the beginning on, on the importance and the value of these uh, guidelines. And there, Wolfgang, uh, Ralf and Bernd Steckemesser are doing a great, uh, great job. So this was for a long time one of my slides in, in my presentations. You can try to disseminate, you can train, you can make curricula, but really implementing, making that people all over the globe or the large majority of hernia surgeons all over the globe are using them, this is really the bottleneck. And I must say that recently, a few years ago, I also added here a question mark and I will tell you why. There are still people even low in this group, in this audience, 6%, who say, we probably don't need guidelines. I will continue doing what I have been doing all my life. I'm an automatic driving surgeon. I know what I'm doing. I don't need uh, people telling me what I have to do. Well, I can fully agree with that. But there is a but. And the but behind it is, you can do whatever you want, but... You have to know your surgical performance. You have to know what you're doing on the short term and on the long term concerning the most important outcome parameters. And this is why I would like to ask you this last question. And I think it's an important one. Are you currently involved in a quality control process of your surgical performance? And we don't talk about hernia. Let's make it more broad. So... If you are involved in any regional, national, or international registry, please answer number one. If you do a local audit in your own department, please answer number two. If you feel this is much too bothersome, you would like to be done, you would like doing it, but it's too bothersome for the moment, you answer three. And if you really think this doesn't make sense, then you answer number four. Again, please vote for surgery all over and not only for hernia surgery. We had 100 people voting for the previous question, so I've, I hope some more people are voting for this important one on quality control. And Hugo will tell us the result in a few moments. Uh, well, we had also, also on, uh, 100 people voting, but uh, well, this is, uh, this is interesting. This is promising on one hand, but still uh, important to see that People want to do it, but one third of the people who answered find it too bothersome. So let's say that almost everybody wants to do it, ladies and gentlemen, 60%, 64%. So two thirds of the, of the uh, audience or the people who voted do it already. And this is great, but one third still finds it too bothersome. So I hope with the rest of my lecture that I will be able to convince you to go to number one. And why not to number two and not to number three? Well, number two, of course, it's good, but it's very difficult to have a benchmarking if you do it only locally in your center. I would say this is a great start and it's a, it's a, it's a benefit for having this spirit into your department of thinking about uh, performance and doing audits. But of course you can, do, you can only compare you with peers if you do it on a higher level. And I will, Try to show you that guide that uh, registries can be very helpful and sometimes or very often are not too bothersome. So these are some examples. This is the guru, if I may say, of world hernia registries uh, from, uh, from Sweden, uh, Erik Nilsson. Um, he started the first uh, national hernia register in Sweden and then Denmark, Germany, France, Europe, United States uh, followed, but Eric Nilsson was really the man who should be uh, congratulated for this uh, uh, initiative in the 90s, uh, I believe. And Eric showed uh, very clearly that registers may improve quality of surgery by giving individual units or surgeons access to their own outcomes. And more than that, compare with peers and compare uh, with others. And we know that if you know that people are looking at you, you have already a tendency to try to perform uh, better. Uh, and that's one of the goals of registry, of course. So 
What about registries in the guidelines? Well, as you can expect, a weak recommendation, 90% following it, countries or regions are suggested to develop and implement registries with high coverage, that's an important one, and long-term follow-up for quality control. So that's, my, that's a very important point, ladies and gentlemen, a registry and the registry is two. And this is what I wanna show here in this slide. Registries are truly, and much, much more than randomized control trials, a reflection of the real world based on these prerequisites. First of all, you need a register with clinical outcomes based on risk adjustment. Not all patients should go and end up in one box. You have to do a kind of risk adjustment based on uh, underlying pathology, based on type of hernias. It should be controlled by peers and not by politicians or authorities. All consecutive patients should be included. If you only pick out the good patients to be included in your registry, a registry does not make any sense. This is a very, very important one. Registries should be user-friendly and inclusion and use of administrative or billing or ICD or coding data, which are high quality, of course, that's, that's necessary, should be already included semi-automatically. The burden for the surgeon should be as minimal as possible. And there, the um, Scandinavian registries with the Swedish and the Danish one are really wonderful examples on how to cover with a minimal input of a surgeon, an almost uh, national um, 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 number of patients uh, consecutive and all over the country. User-friendly software, very important. There should be a kind of monitoring and source data verification to make sure that data in the register are really correct and true. Confounders or possible confounders need to be clearly reported. You need very good statisticians behind you to do a multivariable analysis. Very important, as we already said, is give back the data to the surgeon with information on where he or she stands compared to the rest of the peers. And surgical anonymity for the health administrators should be guaranteed because otherwise the data will be used against us. And this is not the purpose, of course. We first want to know how we are doing and we should get the chance to do and become better. Registries need to be built in a good way. Uh, this is simpler for inguinal hernia, more difficult for incisional or ventral hernia. We know that we have patient variables, procedural variables, and also prosthetic variables. I will come to that in a second. So they need to be included to a certain extent. And here you need to find a balance between burden for the surgeon and scientific value. So you need some basic variables, independent variables from this top of the triangle to be included because otherwise you will not be able to say anything about your data. But it needs to be a good balance between again, surgical burden and scientific value. And of course, outcome is mainly complications, quality of life, recurrences, chronic pain, and so on. I believe in Europe, and for those people joining from Europe, they definitely know what I'm talking about. I believe for Europe, this European Union medical device regulation will change things. And normally, we would already have been started, because you can see here that the uh, implementation phase was uh, planned for May 26 this year, but due to the corona crisis, the EU has decided to postpone this implementation with one year. So we are now talking about May 2021. What does this uh, regulation says? Well, this medical device regulation says that all surgical meshes become high risk devices. All patients will need an implant card. Clinical trials will be used both in post-marketing as now, but also in pre-marketing, and this is new. And you will see here, there will be a very important role for high quality registries and collaboration with surgical societies to know outcomes, to know whether uh, some devices perform better than others uh, as one of the uh, different variables to be included. And uh, all this will be uh, partially included in one European data bank on medical devices, which is called UDAMED. 
So this will change practice and societies, surgical societies, European Heart Society, medical companies and surgeons all together with the EU are working now on trying to put all those pieces of this difficult puzzle together so that everything can be started in one, in one year. There is more than just measuring, ladies and gentlemen. What do I mean with that? And I'm slowly coming to an end, uh, Baher. Uh, there is more than just measuring. If you measure your data uh, and you're doing very well, you can be happy. If you're doing not so well compared to your peers, you have to check what is the cause and what will I do to react? What is my plan to do better and to try to come up with the rescue plan? And of course, this is a very big challenge for surgeons because you know the difference between God and the surgeon is not so different. But the biggest change that we want to be done is also change the mentality of the surgeon. And I'm a surgeon myself, so I should also look into my own heart or my own soul. And uh, I think every surgeon uh, now joining knows perfectly what I mean. What do I mean? Well, we should consider asking advice from a peer, from a colleague, and even refer a patient. And we should not be financially punished uh, to a large extent uh, by referring a patient. And as I said, our mentality, mentality has to change that we should be willing to change practice. And I believe all those five different ingredients from where I started are important for a better quality of our surgery to our patients. Technique, decision support, audit and registration, asking advice and referring patients and changing our mentality to change practice from what we have been doing for so many years if things really do not work out as we would like to. And in this way, if we do this, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that I can conclude in the following way. There are many, many different ingredients for better hernia surgery. But the very first point to me is good measurable quality of care. You don't need to follow guidelines for my purpose, but you have to show that you have a good quality of, work, of, of, of your work, that your recurrence rate, that your patient satisfaction, that your incidence of chronic pain is comparable to your peers and that you're not doing worse. So for this, we need a systematic registration with a sound follow-up. And I believe really that surgeons uh, and European organizations should uh, take that in hand. We're trying to do that with the European Honey Society. It's not easy. We're trying to do that on a local, on a national level. Uh, and I really think this is key and even a bit more important than really strictly following guidelines, yes or no. But high quality guidelines offer a condensed critical review of the current evidence. And for this, they can and are very, very helpful for you because in one booklet of 165 pages, you find most of the evidence uh, summarized. Dissemination is not too bad, but can still always uh, be improved. So this will probably be the new brave new hernia world. It's my last slide. Currently, evidence is mainly built by randomized controlled trials and registries only uh, are involved very partially because many registries are uh, not considered as high level evidence for uh, building this, uh, this evidence in uh, reviews and in meta analysis. This evidence now currently has been the basis for constructing guidelines. But in order to know that guidelines are doing well and improve the patient outcome, we will need these high level registries to show that what we do according or not according to the guidelines really makes sense. This will make registries much more important and it will increase the quality of them. So that here probably the balance will shift. The balance will shift from registries becoming as important or even more important than randomized control trials in the evidence of the next uh, 10, 15 years. And uh, with this slide, uh, Baher, uh, I would like to just give you uh, two more finishing uh, points as you asked me for people who are interested uh, on guidelines. Please have a look uh, or even take a picture. I know it was not allowed, but here you can take a picture because this is uh, a number, an overview of uh, guidelines, classifications, um, 
recommendations for reporting outcome results on uh, different items in hernia repair that the Ingle, that the European Hernia Society, I'm sorry, has published in hernia in the in the last decennia. And this is brand new. Uh, it's an update of the guidelines specifically for laparoscopic repair. Uh, published in surgical endoscopy by the International Endohernia Society of Professor Bittner and Professor Kuckerling, uh, published in surgical endoscopy last year. And very brand new, still, uh, still fresh, is uh, the very nice endeavor of Dr. Henriksen and her team on primary ventral, so umbilical and epigastric hernias. This was a joint initiative of European and American Hernia Society, and they published two papers, one in the BGS and one in the BGS Open, both early this year, on umbilical epigastric and uh, specific primary hernias uh, in rare locations or uh, specific circumstances. So I think with those two slides in addition, you, you will have a quick overview on where to find the current highest level evidence uh, and guidelines in uh, hernia surgery. So thank you very much for uh, attending. I'm uh, ready to answer some uh, Q and A's in the next uh, 15 or 30 minutes. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Baher. Thank you, Professor Mark, for this uh, comprehensive discussion, comprehensive presentation. Actually, I hope this would bring uh, a different uh, impact for our uh, audience and attendees uh, for, uh, for better patient outcome, of course. So before we moving now to the second part of our webinar, that's uh, just to look for all the questions here in Q&A box. So please, for all our audience, please write all your questions again in Q&A, not in chat box. So if anyone have some question, drop in chat box, please move it to Q&A. And now we'll start to address. I, I, I also post the next webinar link. You can find in chat boxes as well. So please, Professor Mark, you can start to look in Q&A box down. You'll find some, we have 38 message. We'll start to click and then we'll see one by one, we still have almost uh, 30 minutes, so we'll try to select the most impactful question uh, to be answered because yeah. we have here uh, 38 questions as well for yeah. the coming 30 minutes. I Thank think you. this will become the hardest part of the whole uh, the whole <laughs> yes. afternoon, uh, Baher. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and so in, the, indeed, the, the first one is already a very interesting one. What about the Zarda technique? Uh, well, I, the first thing I think we have to say is the Zarda is a suture technique, so uh, it's a it's a very elegant suture technique. It's a recent, it's a new suture technique. So this one comes into um, competition with Schuldeis because uh, Schuldeis until now and also in the guidelines has been described as the, the best suture technique. So if you use suture, and again, it's not recommended according to the guidelines. If you use a suture technique, Schuldeis has been uh, favored uh, in the guidelines. Why is that? because the evidence on the Zarda uh, is still low and of moderate quality. So there are no high level studies with long term follow up. There are no data from registries because it's still a relatively recent technique. Um, and it might be that in the end, um, Schuldeis uh, will be at the same level of the Zarda. This is an open question. And whether the Zarda on the long term will be able to give the same data as, uh, as a mesh technique, this is very difficult to say. We know that hernia is partly a collagen disease. Um, and therefore, uh, suture repair and especially suture repair did not perform so well with respect to recurrences. It remains open. Uh, I think in selected cases, everybody can do what he or she wants. Therefore, we became uh healthcare professional and surgeon but again if you use the technique include your data in a kind of registry in a kind of audit so that you can deal with that and and maybe i will say one word on medical legal uh, aspects of guidelines is this a problem if you would say i continue doing this arda and uh, i don't follow those guidelines of hernia search um, is this a medical legal problem well this will not be a medical legal problem unless in one circumstance, I believe. And the circumstance is the following. If you uh, continue using a technique which is not shown in guidelines to be a uh, high level uh, concerning outcome, and you don't inform your patient, you don't document it in your, uh, in your file, 
and you don't perform any audit on your data, I think then you're in trouble. Um, and of course, this is the same if you do Liechtenstein or laparoscopy, but especially if you follow to do a technique which is uh, in, the in the literature, not soundly buttressed. And again, you don't tell it to your patient, you don't do a sound informed consent, you don't mention it in the file, and you don't do an audit, then I think you might be in trouble. Is this due to guidelines? Not at all. Any expert in court will say that irrespective of the presence or the absence of guidelines. At least that's my personal opinion. Let's go to the second question, because otherwise I will keep on chatting here all, uh, all day. These days in my hospital, a question from Ibrahim Turki, Tamur. We are not allowed to do unilateral non-recurrent inguinal hernia repair laparoscopically. Management afraid from aerosols, COVID-19 infection transmission. What do you think? What do you do? Well, indeed, this is a specific corona or COVID uh, situation. Indeed, um, this was also in the time of our lockdown when we were not sure that patients had corona or not. We were advised not to use laparoscopy or to make sure that desufflation and all air CO2 going out of the patient was accumulated in a specific sealed uh, safe box. Uh, now we are um, uh, treating all our patients in surgery after they have done uh, a COVID screening and only negative screenings are operated in our uh, general ward. So now we start again with laparoscopy uh, because the patient with of course a certain number of false negatives uh, with the patient being tested. But I think this is local, um, local uh, guidance uh, by your hospital administration. And of course you have to follow this, I think it is, this make, makes perfectly sense. It has also to do the same with uh, lab cholecystectomy and lab appendix. Um, so let's go to the question of Peter Motale, if I say it well, Peter. How do you approach recurrent sepsis post-mesh in diabetic smoking patients? Well, that's a difficult one because uh, it's, it's, it seems much broader than only inguinal hernias. I think... I think this is such a specific case by case decision that you have to be taken because you are talking about very, very risky patients concerning surgical site occurrences, diabetes, smoking and obesity are the three most important patient related risk factors for um, surgical site occurrences or wound complications. So I think the first here is damage control. It's damage control. You don't want to take care too much about the hernia, but you want to take care about the patient's life and about um, the infection. And the hernia comes on another place. Maybe new types of meshes, um, maybe new types of meshes like the resorbable uh, synthetic meshes uh, have a place here. Uh, also on these resorbable meshes, I have a, I have a strong opinion. Um, Maybe this is a subgroup of patients, uh, but again, do you need this new type of meshes or do you need to use a simple vicryl mesh, a uh, polyglactin mesh where you know that there will be a recurrence? Again, this is a different topic and I'm very happy to discuss that at a later stage, but I think it would lead us now too far to, to go into that detail. But maybe in such patients where synthetic mesh and biologic mesh have been taken care of, I think you should get out of the shit as soon as possible, um, make, have your patient alive, have your patient um, non-septic, non-infected, and treat about the hernia later on. Uh, let's go further, uh, and you will not uh, uh, blame me that I cannot, cannot read this, yes. uh, this name, uh, Baher. Without name. Okay. So it's better to have us all questions without name, please. Yeah. Okay, is it planned to recommend an increase in mesh size? Well, I didn't say that. Indeed, in the guidelines, the minimal mesh dimension for laparoscopic repair is 15 by 10. So I use always a 15 by 13, uh, but the guidelines indeed say that 15 by 10 is the minimum. So if you do less than 15 by 10, you have a higher chance for recurrency. Ahmed uh, Girat, would you make a mesh for a young man, 20 years old, with a small groin hernia? Well, that's a very good one. Personally, I would, um, but is this based on high level evidence, uh, level one evidence? 
No, it isn't. Um, if you if you say small groin hernia, then I I think you have to make a distinction between a small direct or a small indirect hernia. If it's a small direct hernia, I think myself and many other key opinion leaders would go for a mesh. If it's a small indirect one, I really don't know what you should do. Should you do just a simple high ligation as in uh, children? Should you do a Marcy repair with one stitch at the internal ring? Should you do a shouldice? with damaging the floor and reconstructing the floor when the floor is not damaged at all? Should you do a disarda? Should you do a laparoscopy or Liechtenstein? I really don't know. I myself do a Liechtenstein. If it's a very, <coughs> excuse me, if it's a very slim patient with a small indirect hernia, I would use a large pore mesh or a lightweight mesh. Um, but in all other circumstances, I would use an, uh, a simple, uh, normal, uh, uh, synthetic uh, synthetic mesh, but again, here you can uh, here you can uh, debate about. Um, I'm uh, I'm truly sure about about that, and there is some literature in favor and against. I think this would be an excellent uh, group to to check in uh, national or international registries uh, prospectively. Young man, small indirect hernia L1, lateral small one hernia. Um, to see what uh, what uh, ideally should be done. Again, Baer, I, I continue, but uh, if if there is a comment uh, coming up um, or in the chat box, based on my uh, reply, please uh, wake me up and alert me. Uh, but otherwise, I just go on if that's okay with okay. you. We have 20 minutes, I think, to the end of the discussion. So we'll try to pick some more impactful questions from the 35 questions. So you mean today. I can skip a few questions? <laughs> I don't know. You just try to select some some most impactful question because we have okay. almost forty now become forty five questions. Okay. <laughs> Roll. I, I will. I will be short. So again, the advantage of short is 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 being that that uh, uh, it goes faster and we can run over many different questions. The adv the disadvantage, of course, is that many answers, uh, especially in the Q and A, are give a, need a balanced uh, answer. But anyhow, I will try. Is there a role or of orchidectomy in recurrent hernia in early patients? I think no, not standard. Um, uh, I normally never do an orchidectomy in a recurrent hernia, even not in a young or in an elderly patient. Uh, I don't think it has a place. Dr. Jacobo, are there any recommendations, guidelines for laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair during COVID-19 compared to open? Well, again, I alluded to that in the first question. Moreover, here I think you have to follow local institutional or national guidelines. These are so different uh, region per region or country per country. Um, if you want to read it on a European level, please uh, then go to the EAS website. But this is so locally uh, dependent that I prefer not to go into that uh, for the moment. Okay. Any guidelines for obstructed and irreducible inguinal and paraumbilical hernias? Well, that's a very good one. Let me go first go to para umbilical because it was not a, it was not really the topic of today. But I think uh, an irreducible uh, obstructed para umbilical hernia and uh, inguinal. Um, I would always go first for a laparoscopy uh, with a five millimeter scope, unless the patient is so severely obstructed that the laparoscopy is not feasible for my anesthetists or not feasible for myself because of the abdomen being so much distended. But in all other cases, I would prefer first to see what's in the sack, to reduce it under view. Um, most of these patients don't have a CT scan because otherwise the CT might be helpful. But even then, I would like to see it reduced under view. Um, then I would do my repair. For instance, uh, if I have an incarcerated umbilical, I will do a laparoscopy. I will try to reduce if possible. I will then do a TEP because I'm a TEP guy. And at the end of the surgery, I will come back through the umbilicus by going intra-abdominally, so converting TEP to laparoscopy and checking the viability of the bowel loop that uh, now is reduced for 30 or 40 minutes after the surgery. Of course, there is uh, also the possibility to convert to a Liechtenstein if, if needed or if the surgery is too difficult. But even if you are not a laparoscopic surgeon, I think here the value of laparoscopy by just looking at what is the content of the 
incarcerated uh, hernia and how does it look at the end makes it so much more valuable you can choose where to make your incision you can inspect and decide do i need to take it out or not so here i think the role of laparoscopy even that if you're not a laparoscopic uh, surgeon is so much uh, important what kind of mesh do you prefer for tapp or tep so uh, myself i'm using a uh, large uh, sorry a normal pore uh, polypropylene mesh in most circumstances for my uh, TEP. So a very simple uh, polypropylene, very cheap. Uh, my colleague is using the 3D mesh. Uh, I'm using the simple flat one. Um, but so the standard is normal uh, weight or normal pore in comparison to Liechtenstein, as we just said in the guidelines. Excellent overview. Would you please recommend the options for complicated inguinal hernia? Well, I think I just said that, uh, and perforation, of course, is different. Uh, again, then you have first to sort out the infection. But for obstruction, again, laparoscopy for me, first have a look inside and then decide how to continue. Examples of light and heavyweight meshes. Well, the, the, the heavyweight ones, again, this is a lecture on its own, uh, uh, Dr. Anonymous attendee. Um, heavyweight, most people consider uh, the Marlex mesh, the, bar, the, the, the normal barred mesh or the normal, normal proline mesh um, as the uh, classical, uh, the parietene mesh from uh, Medtronic as the classical um, heavyweight mesh. Um, and all the others, parietene light, um, all the light uh, versions, uh, soft mesh, uh, whatever you call it, um, these are the lightweight meshes. I think the most important that you have to ask to your rep is what is the pore size, the general pore size, because pore size and pore size is again two. But what is the standard pore size of your mesh? Is it, is it less than one millimeter? We call it then a standard mesh because most heavyweight meshes have a pore size of about 700 micron, 800 micron, which is less than one millimeter. The large pore meshes, as I said in the slides, should have a, a pore size of one to one and a half millimeter. So that's for pore size. And for weight, I think the, the proposal made by, by Ine Brugmans, I think is the very correct one. Less than 50 or 40 gram per square millimeter is, sorry, square meter is light. More than 70 or 80 gram per square meter is heavy. And between 40, 50 and 70, 80, is by many surgeons considered as middleweight uh, mesh. But so please ask that to your rep, know which material you are using, because then you will be much stronger in, uh, in reflection to your patient um, if you know which material you are using. So that's a, a very important point. Young fit van with medium size hernia, what is the technique of your choice? Well, again, my first choice uh, in my tailoring, uh, people who don't like me will say you don't tailor. Well, I do, but again, tailoring and tailoring is two. If I have a patient um, coming with an inguinal hernia who has not been operated, primary, unilateral, or bilateral, and the patient can undergo a general anesthesia and is agreeing with the general anesthesia, I will go for a laparoscopic uh, TEP repair. But again, that's my personal opinion. This is not. Uh, a guideline statement. Does method of fixation matter? In case of lightweight mesh, I took out the part of uh, fixation uh, because I thought it would uh, it would bring us too far. Um, I think a very important one is that most hernias do not need fixation, and um, that what I mean is that classical Ingual hernias treated laparoscopically can be treated with a normal, normal pore mesh without any fixation. The guidelines say mesh fixation should be done in bigger direct hernias, two fingers, three fingers of a direct medial hernia. Those I fix also with a penetrating fixation device, with a one or two penetrating fixation devices on the Cooper ligament. Can we use Atraumatic fixation, glue, or uh, self-fixating meshes for those hernias? I'm not sure. 
because we I don't think we have high level evidence to say that bigger direct hernias can be treated equally with a non-traumatic mesh fixation as with a traumatic mesh fixation. Moreover, my uh, rationale for the traumatic mesh fixation is that I use only one or two fixation devices, even non-resorbable in the Cooper ligament, and mostly only one. Uh, this is for me, and I think for the literature, not a cause of chronic pain if you use only one on the Cooper ligament. But again, this is uh, not high level evidence. If the high level evidence of the guidelines has to be taken into account, the guidelines say, if you have a bigger direct hernia and you do a laparoscopy, fix your mesh with an, uh, fix your mesh by any material, by any um, device um, before finishing the surgery. What about lightweight mesh? Well, as I said, most, most literature does not trust lightweight mesh at all in laparoscopic repair. Some people do it systematically. I think there is no harm of using a uh, heavyweight mesh, first of all. And the benefit of lightweight mesh has not been shown, according to my opinion, in laparoscopic repair. So that's the reason why I don't use systematically a lightweight mesh, because the benefit has not been shown on the contrary in laparoscopic repair. I hope I make myself uh, clear to uh, Dr. Khalifa. Let me go on. If interrupt me again, Baher, if I need to. Would obesity divide, divert you away from laparoscopic repair? I would say for, uh, for an ingular hernia, on the contrary. Um, because you have a higher risk for wound complications. Uh, and we, I, we, I mean, we don't talk now about uh, super obesity with a BMI of 55, but an obese patient, 30, 35, BMI 40, I think laparoscopy is ideal for an uh, ingular hernia repair. Uh, this one is an easy one. I got my answer. Can you use have lost ten minutes? Sorry, we have lost ten minutes. That's fine. Yes. Yeah. Can using a medium mesh resolve the dispute just, just, between yeah, between light and heavy? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. It's an excellent question, um, and I must say I don't know. It could be that we just need something in between. But again, the definition of light and heavy, the definition of pore size, is so debatable that we need more evidence, we need more guidance in this era. Hernia is a collagen disease. My question, is there any study to improve collagen production in the body, genetic or drugs? Dr. Fates, stop smoking, I would say. <laughs> but for the rest, I have no uh, idea. I think if you stop smoking, you will improve probably your collagen production. I don't know how long it will take. Uh, but that's the only thing I, I, uh, I know about. I don't know about any other uh, alternatives for the moment. What is the consensus for closing the hernia neck in laparoscopic hernia repair? Well, um, normally you don't close the hernia neck, uh, unless Dr. Abdel Hafiz means something else. Uh, because if you go by TAPP, you will reduce the hernia and you will close the peritoneum. If you go by TEP, you will reduce the hernia sac and you will just leave it. I know that some people will do something with the hernia neck. They will twist it or they will close it or put a suture in order to avoid a kind of internal herniation. But I have never seen it that a, a hernia neck in the peritoneum will cause an internal hernia. It's different when you keep the peritoneum open, then the patient might develop an internal hernia after uh, laparoscopic repair. So I don't close the hernia neck uh, by any means in laparoscopic repair. And in TEP, I try to avoid opening the peritoneum by all means so that I don't have to close anything. If you have to close the hernia neck in a large scrotal indirect hernia in, for instance, a young adult, then I most of the time use an endoloop uh, to close the, the hernia neck uh, circumferentially. I don't use clips. I don't use a suture. I use a, a vicral in the loop at that moment. OK, I should have looked at the second question. I mean the closure of the defect. All right. So closure of the defect. Well, this is a question for TAPP people. I think most TAPP people now use a barbed suture uh, because it's, it goes faster. You don't need to make a suture in the end. But 
there is a, one important drawback if you use a barbed suture for closing the peritoneum after TAPP, leave only a short tail or bury the short tail at the end. Because if you leave a long tail of your barbed suture intra-abdominally, it can act like uh, an adhesion and cause a severe obstruction um, with dramatic consequences. Um, let's go further by here, I continue. Any place for only suture repair if the effect is small and muscles are strong? Well, we, dis we discussed already about a young man with a small indirect hernia. Maybe there is a place. Uh, and uh, I have already alluded to that uh, before. I don't do it, but uh, I think there is a, a place to be investigated. In practice, not in the world of fantasy, does laparoscopic repair has a higher recurrence rate that's a good one. That's a very good one. Um, if you do it properly with a large mesh, I think the recurrence rate is not higher as in Liechtenstein. So this is what the literature also says. About 4 or 5%, I think, is real world data. Some end up in 10. In the ideal world of randomized trials, it's about 1 to 2. But I think real world data are about 5% both for open, both for laparoscopic repair. Uh, and again, if you use a large mesh, um, and another point that I want to make is the position of my mesh will be adapted to the type of the hernia. What do I mean with that? A large direct hernia, my mesh will largely overlap the midline. In a large indirect hernia or a scrotal hernia, my mesh will largely overlap to the psoas. And if, maybe I will even fix it laterally with glue um, to avoid sliding of the mesh in the, in the defect. And for a large femoral hernia, I will put the mesh as deep as possible. And very often for a femoral hernia, I will fix it again with one traumatic fixation device on the Cooper ligament. Uh, so this is uh, maybe the question for, uh, for this. Uh, sorry, the answer for this question, I'm sorry. Thank you for marvelous talk. How will you approach a patient with groin pain during walk or cuff? Clinical examination is completely normal. Radiological investigations normal. No previous groin surgery. Well, Dr. Uh, Abdullah, this is a, again, this is a lecture on its own. Um, I, would, I, I will not go into detail. I will just say one thing. The chance for having a hernia is very low. There is one argument in favor and there is one argument against. The argument in favor is that it could be a small preperitoneal lipoma and this can be missed by a radiologist and this will be missed by a laparoscopy. But a good clinical examination in a non-obese patient should be able to find it. So if you don't find anything, I would be extremely cautious to operate and I would probably not operate. And that's my second point. Even, even if I have a positive ultrasound. And I think this is the risk because in Belgium and in many other Western European countries, many, many patients are coming with an ultrasound of the GP. And the ultrasound says inguinal hernia and I don't feel bloody anything. And I don't see anything and the patient has never seen anything. Well, I will, I will look at this patient with my physical rehabilitation specialist. We will check for the hip for prostatitis, for the adductor tendon tendinopathy, um, for acne syndrome, for anything. But be very, very, very cautious for doing a hernia repair, even with a positive ultrasound. Um, if the patient has pain and no swelling, this is the dangerous patient. So think twice, show it to a colleague, ask advice before embarking on it. You will save a lot of trouble. Difference between light and heavy weight. I think I have said that uh, extensively, uh, so I will continue, Dr. Grandi. Is Parietex Progrip heavy or lightweight mesh, as this mesh is used for both open and laparoscopic? Indeed. Um, well, Parietex is polyester. You have Parietene, um, which is um, polypropylene, and Parietex is um, polyester. And this uh, Parietex is a, a large pore mesh. 
So I think most people consider it as a, a, a lightweight uh, mesh. I don't think there is pariatex light. No, there is no pariatex uh, light or, or normal. Pariatex is polyester and is a large pore mesh. But Baher, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's like that, polyester large pore. OK. Baher will check and, uh, and uh, reply to Dr. Khalil. Uh, uh, later on. Yes, we, we, we'll approach him. We'll approach okay. him. Ask him. We'll answer. Uh, are we need to fix pro grip mesh by sutures during open repair? That's a very good one. There, there have been some papers, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, that showed a higher recurrence rate when the medial part of the pro grip mesh was not fixed on the uh, above the pubis, so cranial to the pubis. So I don't uh, use it because uh, I think there is no proven benefit of ProGrip except some time gain. That's true. You win, you win some uh, eight to 10 minutes per surgery uh, in Liechtenstein. But in a an, in an direct hernia, in a larger direct hernia, I would put one additional suture where you place the additional suture, medial suture of the Liechtenstein repair, even when you use a ProGrip. Uh, that's what I would do, but again, this is a uh, uh, personal opinion based on my own uh, inguinal and on the literature. Inguinal hernia has two times recurrent. What is the third step of methods? Well, as I said, after anterior go posterior, after posterior go anterior, if you have a, a second recurrence, so a third hernia, I think again, you should discuss with your colleague uh, where the uh, second recurrence should be uh, operated and the approach. Uh, I think this is very individual, Dr. Uh, Al Hussein. So I, uh, I can uh, not give you any concrete advice on that. Um, time left, uh, Baher. It's uh, 1631. What do you think? Almost we have, we, if we can have uh, one or two more questions, that would okay. be too. And okay. then we start to announce for the next webinar. Do you recommend an emergency femoral hernia? Well, the same. First do a laparoscopy. And then you can decide what is in, try to reduce. If you cannot reduce, uh, you can try, you can try to uh, open the pectineal uh, ligament. Uh, on, sorry, the um, lacunar ligament on the medial side, away from the vessels, of course. Um, and if that doesn't work, um, I would convert to open surgery whether through transingual or, or, or anterior femoral based on the age of the patient and so on. But first, again, do a laparoscopy. Last one, maybe, for Dr. Abdel Sayed. The problem we faced in training how to do most of surgical management, there are centers to learn how to do surgical management by different ways. I'm sorry, but that's a difficult one. I don't want to end this way, Baher. So we can take more? OK. Yeah, with one more. <laughs> one more yes. from Dr. When you use Liechtenstein technique, how do you fix your lightweight mesh? Yes, good, good question. Uh, I fix it normally as a normal mesh, which means running polypropylene according uh, along to the uh, pupa's ligament. I use two or three vicral sutures cranial. And I think the most important, and thank you, Dr. Tepes, for this question, the most important technical uh, adaptation in using a lightweight mesh in Liechtenstein is having an overlap of half to one centimeter of the mesh at the inguinal ligament, at the pupa's ligament where you fix it. Because earlier studies have shown that if you fix it edge of the mesh to edge of the ligament, you have a higher chance of tearing out of these large pores. So make sure you have a half centimeter to centimeter overlap at this uh, inguinal ligament. Uh, again, thank you for this uh, technical, important question. Baher, I will not look at other questions because I will. <laughs> so I think the discussion is very, very interactive and a lot of questions. I can see almost like uh, 54 more questions still remaining. So I think we should organize uh, another another kind of webinar dedicated only for this kind of uh, Q&A answers, uh, Q&A sessions to, to take all these um, uh, questions from, from the audience. Well, Maybe I, it was, I, I... Uh, I, I just want to say, Baher, thank you for giving me the opportunity and thank you for all these questions for this uh, large audience, because I, I think this shows to us, to you as Metronic, uh, this shows that inguinal hernia is still so, so very popular and so very debatable. So let's do things together 
to to improve our quality, to improve our understanding. Thank you for uh, hosting us. Yes, thank you, Professor uh, Mark, to have uh, to be with us. Actually, in behalf of Medtronic, I would like to thank you again and thank all our audience and have and I hope all they are enjoyed the experience. And of course, we'll check. We we'll keep checking with you again to see your next uh, next time availability to host uh, another more successful webinar like uh, such uh, uh, to to uh, to accommodate all those questions raised from the from the audience and even touch more point in in hernia or in guinal hernia in specific. So uh, thank you and please allow me to if you let me to uh, to share uh, the next uh, webinars that we are scheduling. Uh, yes, so uh, I, I will start sharing this next webinar that we are running for all our audience to be aware of. So uh, next Tuesday, actually, uh, we had this one by, by you, sir. Thank you again. And then we'll have the next one the next Tuesday on guidance for hernia surgeon and trainees on challenge on COVID-19. So we'll have uh, a speakers from European Hernia Society and we have also some author for this uh, document. So it would be very fantastic and I encourage all to join us. And then we'll follow it by another one specifically for laparoscopic ventral hernia repair is by uh, Professor Dr. Henry Hoffman. And also we'll have a session for in tip technique in specific with uh, Dr. Marius Popidus from Greece. So I hope uh, this will bring a value for all our audience. Uh, and, and, and again, again, sir, uh, uh, I would like to thank you for your time and for your dedication and for all our audience. You're very welcome. Uh, we Metronic, really, thank you all. Me too. Thank you very much. And thanks to all attendees. Thanks to Metronic for organizing. Have a very nice uh, rest of the day. Bahir, thank you very much. Thank you, thank sir. You. Bye -bye. Keep in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Hugo. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Keep in touch.